We live in a fantasy world now. Reality has been destroyed. This is the time that you really need to pay attention. The probabilities are overwhelmingly on gold's side. That is the best environment to see gold increase its value. Welcome to Palisades Gold Radio. I'm your host, Tom Bodrovics. Joining me today is Mikhail Thorup, author, podcaster, and consultant on the topic of moving and investing offshore. Thanks for joining me today, Mikhail. Thanks very much for having me, Tom. I'm looking forward to today's conversation. I had a look through your back catalog of episodes, and I saw a lot of familiar names and a lot of friends that have been on the show. So yeah, I'm really excited about today. I think it should be a good conversation. Absolutely. You and I have had the, the pleasure of speaking to a lot of the same people. And in, in some ways, we we cover the same topics, but from from very different points of view. You know, we were kind of talking before we started the recording here about, you know, the idea of not necessarily just creating wealth, but also protecting it and protecting your in some ways your your liberty and your ability to enjoy some of that wealth. So why don't we start with why someone would want to move offshore and, and share with our listeners how many countries that you have been to? <laughs> okay, I have been traveling since the year 2000. So depending when you're listening to this, I mean, as the recording this, I've been traveling for 22 years straight. And I mean, straight, like, I don't mean, oh, I took a little one week vacation, then went home for a year and then took another week vacation. Now, I've been to 107 countries over the last 22 years. I have lived in nine different countries. Um, I wrote books about it. I podcast about it. I have a newsletter, a huge uh, Facebook group about it. Um, I mean, it is my business is, is helping people move offshore. But even from the first, the personal side, I mean, I'm Canadian. I was born and raised in southwestern Ontario. My wife is from mainland China. I met her in Germany. We got married in Africa. My daughter was born in the Middle East. My son was born in Brazil. And we're I'm talking to you today from Panama City, Panama. So it's not just from the business side that I do these things. It is my real life as well. So that's kind of the, the first part of, of a bit about my experience. But why someone might want to do something like this? I mean, I would never expect people to do the same type of travel or protection or diversification that I do. First of all, I do a lot of it because I need to test things. If I'm going to speak about them or be on stage or podcast or YouTube about it, I need to know that it actually works. You know, this is not just theory. I'm not an armchair traveler or armchair, you know, consultant. I do these things for real life. But maybe some of the more tangible reasons that people might want to do it is there can be very good tax uh tax mitigation strategies, legal, I will, I will absolutely highlight, legal tax mitigation strategies. There's diversification. A lot of people think that diversification just means maybe a bit of real estate down the street, some stocks and bonds, and maybe some precious metals held in a bank vault or something like that. For me, that is totally not diversified. I mean, I'm looking at diversification through countries, through time, through like expiration, through different types of assets, alternative assets, um, how it is structured, how you're holding it, um, the tax situation, the, the jurisdiction, the language that it's held in. I mean, I live in a civil law country here in Panama. We have uh, Spanish is obviously the local language. So it's like, if you come after me for one of my assets and it's held here, well, was the complaint done in Panama or was it done in the US? Do you understand a civil law and how the laws work here? You know, if you're coming from a common law country like the UK or something like that, do you speak Spanish? Do you have a lawyer here? I mean, there's so many different types of reasons on this cross border that you really want to think about that maybe are not apparent at the very first time of looking at it. it might, mm -hmm. Most people would just say, oh, you're doing it because of taxes. It's like, no, there's actually a thousand and one other reasons. And some of them are very analytical and some of them are very personal. Like, I like living overseas. I think it's cool to learn new languages and meet new people and speak to people who have a completely different perspective on life. I mean, for me, that is all worthwhile. So that's kind of a a very long answer to a very short question, but there's there's a lot we can explore in that. Absolutely. And, you know, that's a hell of a resume of, of the different countries that you visited, lived in, and, and experienced, right? And of course, your the title of your book is Expat Secrets, How to Pay Zero Taxes, Live Overseas, and Make Giant Piles of Money. And while I, I know that you have, have said before that was a bit of an inflammatory 
title that in some ways does capture the spirit of the idea of wanting to diversify, like you said, your not only your your finances, but let's say your your legal risks, your freedom, things like that. So in your experience, what are some of the most restrictive countries that you've traveled to? Wow. Okay. I mean, I was in El Salvador in 2003. That wasn't a very good situation. Um, I've drove across Africa. Like I've been to South Africa, Botswana, Zimbabwe. I've been to Nigeria multiple times, Uganda. Um, actually, we went hiking with the silverback mountain gorillas. Um, and we were probably the only human beings, or at least the only tourists on that day on planet Earth to see gorillas in their natural habitat. Um, I've been to Iran, which was a very beautiful country. I was there probably almost 10 years ago in Iran, uh, maybe maybe seven or eight years ago in Iran. Um, I went to North Korea in 2012, I think it was, 2012, 2013. Uh, we went in through China, flew into Pyongyang, spent about two weeks there, and then took a train from Pyongyang back to Beijing like a 22, 24 hour train trip through North Korea and could see all the countryside, got to meet lots of people. And um, I like going to random places that other people have not been to. It's like, yeah, I've been to Italy and I've been to Paris and I've been to London and all over Germany and stuff like that. It's all mm -hmm. cool. And I, I enjoy that. But I like going to some of the places which are as radically different as you could possibly imagine being from North America or from Western culture. Mm -hmm. So maybe a, a different way to ask that question is what are some of the most, let's say, abusive countries that when you enter, you feel very restricted trying to, you know, enter or, or just move around it? Oh, the United States, for sure. Mm -hmm. The United States is bar none, the worst country for entering. I have so many stories of trying to get in and out of the States and just being harassed there. I remember last time we went back to China, probably about three years ago, and we were coming back and it was probably like a 40 hour uh, flight. And we had stopped in it was Houston and we were waiting for immigration because when you fly through the States, you actually have to enter the United States, which means you have to go through immigration, collect all your bags and then recheck in, which is not standard anywhere else in the world. If you're doing a transit flight, you just you're all what's called airside. So you've you're on security from your um departure destination, and you don't enter back in until your final arrival. And I remember I was there, I, I have a, a five-year-old daughter, she was probably about two or three at the time, and we needed to use the bathroom. And I asked a, one of these big TSA security guides, um, you know, where's the bathroom? No, no bathroom. Come on, there's got to be a bathroom around here. There's got to be a bathroom that you guys use. She's like three years old, no, wouldn't allow. So she ended up peeing herself in the middle of line and then was obviously crying and so embarrassed. So then I had to hold her. So now I have pee all down the front of mine. And I'm like, that's it. I'm done. I am absolutely done with the United States. These rules and these laws are absolutely abusive. And this is not stopping terrorism. This is not stopping drug trafficking or something like this. But I mean, in every other country in the world, it doesn't work like this. I mean, you can go to Africa and go to South America. It's pretty straightforward. I mean, things have gotten more difficult since this COVID-1984 came into play. I don't agree with any of that, but I'm still out there traveling. I'm still making it work. Mm -hmm. So actually, you know, as, as you mentioned that, what are or, or have you really found that, let's say, out of the U.S. and, and Canada, these the, the more Western countries, has your your travel been you know severely affected and, and hampered by the the you know quarantine restrictions and, and rules like that? I mean, I I have still been traveling pretty much the entire time. I mean, we spent six months in Brazil, that was wide open. We were in Mexico for two weeks, I was in Colombia for three weeks, I was in Costa Rica for three weeks. I did actually have to go back to the United States at one point to speak on stage at, a, at an offshore conference in Vegas. I broke my own rule on that one, but I haven't had to go back to the UK or France or any of these types of countries. Um, I was supposed to do a Portugal trip. It got canceled because of this, this stuff that's going on. The airlines canceled it. But I mean, I haven't been back to Canada in three years. I mean, I just refuse to go back to these places now. Mm -hmm. So to kind of contrast your your experience getting back into the US, what are some of the most the most free countries that you've entered into and and been through? 
Well, Brazil at the time when we went there was completely wide open. Since they since that has happened, they have mandated um, vaccine certificate to enter the country. My understanding is once you get in the country, it's wide open again. There's very little masking. There's very little restrictions. Of course, it's going to depend on which state or which province that you're in, which area. We were in Florianopolis, which is a small island on the south of the country. And it was amazing. There was a giant group of libertarians there. We were all having nice barbecue every day and drinking rum and capainas and smoking cigars. And it was like COVID did not exist. We're actually going back in a few days or, or next week or something like that, back to Floripa for a little bit. And then we go to Uruguay to check out what the situation is like there. Um, Uruguay is supposed to be quite open as well. They did restrict their borders during COVID. But from my understanding at the moment, it is completely open. So um, I have a law firm there that I'm working with on some international investments. So I've got to go down there to do some due diligence for my clients. And then I'll be able to report back on that. Um, otherwise, I mean, Costa Rica was easy. You just needed to show some type of an insurance when you entered into the country that would actually cover you for COVID. But there was no vaccine mandates. There was no PCR test or anything like that. Once again, that's from when I was there several months ago. Mm -hmm. um, things change kind of on a daily basis. So you really have to do research, like, I mean, not even like a couple of months in advance, like that day, mm -hmm. you know, we bought our tickets to go back to South America uh, a month ago. And I haven't even really started planning out these things because I know it'll change five times and then back again. So you just end up wasting your time. So I try not to stress about it or think about it too much. Mm -hmm. So do you, do you find that, you know, the, the restrictions to enter a lot of these countries are starting to, to get easier and, and better now that, that, you know, the, the worst of it for now seems to be behind us? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's back to business as usual now. It was COVID, 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 and now it's war, 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 war. So I think that they will cool off for a little while and there's being a big rollback. If you look at Scandinavia, they've removed all mask mandates, all COVID passports, all testing to enter the country. And this is Scandinavia, someone that is known for socialism, not no one, not a country that is known for freedom by any standard. Mm -hmm. um, we're seeing this in the UK. We're seeing this all over the world. Um, so I think that they will never admit what they have done is criminal and they've ruined people's lives. I think that they'll just kind of let it fade into the background and they'll move on with the conversation, which at the moment is war, which is very tragic. Mm -hmm. Pick up, pick up the next uh, easy distraction. Exactly. So I'd like to move on to, you know, the kind of the financial side, of course, your, your podcast is called the expat money show. So financially, what are some considerations that that we need to think about when we consider moving some of your assets outside of your country of origin? I mean, you can think about it kind of the same way that you would think about precious metals. A lot of people on this show obviously are big into precious metals. I mean, probably no one is allocating 100% of their portfolio to gold or 100% of their portfolio to silver. I would suggest, you know, a percentage of your net worth of moving it offshore. And we can look at Canada as an example. If you had everything tied up to Canada and you decided that you wanted to support the Canadian trucker convoy, well, now you are a domestic terrorist and Justin Castro is going to reach into your bank account and take your money. And I mean, like, I don't agree with that. I think that is really, really scary. We've seen this cancel culture that started with social media, you know, six, seven years ago, and then it moved on to uh, celebrities and to brands, and now they're canceling countries. So what do you think, what makes you think they won't come after you at some point? I mean, it's a pretty deadly weapon, the one that they're pointing around right now. So I think it's kind of irresponsible if you're putting all your eggs in one basket, if everything is correlated. If you're American, you have only U.S. equities and U.S. investments, and everything is done through U.S. banking in USD. I mean, that's not diversified. That's really scary. But if you start getting an offshore bank account, something that's outside of the reach of creditors, lawyers, uh, your government, I mean, I think that's a smart move. I'm not saying don't declare it. Obviously, you still have to declare it. There's still a lot of filing requirements for all of these types of things. But it behooves you to move a little bit offshore. Same thing with real estate. Getting a property, you know, if you're a real estate investor and you have 10 properties and they're all in your backyard, like 
why not buy something down in Costa Rica and have a holiday home? You know, there can be tax advantages for going down there and checking on the property, you know, legitimate tax um, considerations. Um, you know, you're going to have diversification in a new currency. Just make sure that that, cons- that currency is one that you want to be in. You know, probably you don't want to be in the Bolivar or, you know, in a peso or something like this. If you're in Argentina or Venezuela or Bolivia or these types of ones. So you have to be smart about it. But these are the types of things that we talk about on the podcast, like literally every single week. So if you guys go to Expat Money Show, you'll be able to see 179 episodes about these types of topics, you know, or the newsletter where I'm emailing three, four, five days a week. And we go through all of this stuff and we keep up to date about it because what I'm saying today, tomorrow could absolutely make no sense. I mean, I was on the phone with uh, a lawyer in Ukraine about three weeks ago or four weeks ago, right before the invasion. And we were looking at, oh, okay, you know, Ukrainian real estate, how does this look? How do you title it? How can you um, get a, a residency on the back end of it? What does this look like? The costs involved, the structuring, how do we set up the bank account? I mean, I did multiple calls, multiple, multiple hour calls, figuring all this stuff out. And at the time, we didn't think that Putin was going to invade. And he did. And it was like, so, you know, that would not have worked out. But if that was, if you have multiple plans, then you're spreading your risk. So. Yeah. That kind of goes back to work, back to your point of, of um, basically checking on these things as, as they evolve. Right. Exactly. I mean, what works today might not work tomorrow and add to that, that a lot of the doors are closing. We've seen this with citizenship by investment programs when Cyprus closed down a couple of years ago. Now there's more restrictions on Portugal. Now there's like all these immigration issues, they're changing. So it's like, if you get into the program today, then you're kind of grandfathered in. If you miss it, there's no way to go backwards. So it's like, you know, this is not things that you want to put off. Like I would say, when you're done listening to this episode, like take a piece of paper, take a pen, write down a couple of ideas and then put them into action. And then once you get those one or two or three things done, then put a couple more things in. And again and again, and it's not something you have to do all at once. I mean, I've been doing this for 22 years, building this up and talking mm-hmm. about these types of things. And if you really don't know what to do, then reach out to me. And of course, I will do my best to absolutely help your audience. Mm-hmm. And and of course, you put a lot of this information out for free to be able to help as many people as you can, as as I've heard you say in the past. And it's it's kind of interesting and, and timely that you mentioned the the Ukraine piece because a couple of weeks ago I had a Russian citizen on the podcast, and he was explaining to us what the situation is like on the ground in Russia. You know, not being able to get any other currencies than the ruble at the time, not basically being able to buy gold, having all of his brokerage accounts basically frozen because there's no trading in the stock market. You know, it just comes back to the idea that you're you're not going to be worse off for taking some of these steps to protect yourself. So, you know, when when we think about, let's say, for example, getting an offshore bank account, do you feel that that is let's say somewhat more risky considering you know the actions of of and and in in some ways the the precedent that was set by the Canadian government to seize people's bank accounts versus let's say holding precious metals overseas i like both i mean mm-hmm. i have gold <laughs> vaults i have safety deposit box i have offshore bank accounts i also have a lot of crypto i mean privacy coins there's a lot there it's not just a one thing or what is best. Mm -hmm. It is about all and everything. And as I said before, it's about building them one at a time and understanding how it works. I mean, precious metals held in an offshore vault, well, you you have to understand how it's stored. What are the laws? What are the reporting requirements? What are the taxes coming in? What are the tax obligations for your home country? How are all of these things viewed? You know, so you mean there's a lot to research, there's a lot to understand. So it's really important to work with professionals on these types of things. And it's easy to say an offshore bank account, but where is the offshore bank account? What kind Mm -hmm. of currency is it done in? You know, okay, are you holding the local currency? Are you holding international currencies? Is this another USD account? Or maybe you want to hold uh, RMB or Singaporean dollars or um, GBP, uh, Great British pounds or euros. I probably would not suggest euros, but I mean, how does this all look? What is the history of the bank? What is the deposit requirements? Um, do they have online banking? Is there a card for it? There's so many things to look at 
But yes, I absolutely encourage you to get an offshore bank account to get some type of precious metal storage. Um, I personally only work with 100% allocated, 100% segregated or safety deposit boxes. I don't believe in paper gold, or if I want to do paper gold, then it is purely speculative and it is just a way to have liquidity. I would never consider that as the inflation hedge that I'm using in other aspects of my portfolio, which I'm sure you've probably done lots of episodes on, on these types of things. But um, yeah, there's many things to think about and many different ways to view it. Like what is your goal? Like Tom, your goal might be totally different than my goal. Maybe you're like, okay, I need for zombie apocalypse. I want to have small silver pieces held offshore, but then how am I going to get them or anything like that? Someone else might be, well, I don't want to file any reporting. Okay. Well then that needs to be in something where you have the key. If you're a U.S. citizen, then you want to make sure it doesn't become a financial account. I mean, it's just, everybody goals are completely different than this. So it's kind of a difficult question to answer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I appreciate you mentioning the, the importance of fully allocated and, and segregated precious metal storage. It's something that, you know, we ha we have touched on absolutely many, many times on the show and it's, uh, it's always worth repeating. Yeah. So how do cryptocurrencies fit into your portfolio as well? And, and what role do you think that they play when let's say transacting across borders? Okay. I look at cryptocurrencies maybe a little bit different. I really use them for I, I'm not hodling crypto. I'm using it in my everyday life. I do high-end consulting. I work mostly with high net worth individuals or actually strictly with high net worth individuals. Um, I like getting paid in crypto. It's very fast. It's very easy. It's very mm -hmm. secure. And I'm able to pay for other goods and services in crypto. I think that removing the third party in a lot of instances is really good. I don't do 100% crypto. I still need to buy my groceries. I like cash, you know, so I can have international wire transfers for those types of things. But having half of everything done in crypto does give me a lot of opportunities and a little bit more fortitude with my business and with my portfolio. And, you know, who knows, maybe one day I'm going to get canceled and they're going to decide, all right, no more merchant accounts, no more bank accounts, no more PayPal, no more any of this type of thing. I mean, I hope that doesn't happen. I mean, I follow all of the laws. I hope it all, I follow all of the rules, but I'm also a little bit outspoken and, you know, I pick fights with communists all the time. So, you know, who knows? They might come after me. Um, being set up in crypto definitely gives me a peace of mind. I mean, I'm not looking at it as a speculative play. I, I know and understand a lot about the decentralized finance system. I think that's very interesting, but I mean, it's not something where I would, be actively giving advice on those types of things. I would work with someone who has a lot more experience on it. You know, I really focus on, you know, the tax strategies, the immigration strategies, the real estate, those that's more where I live, but for the crypto, I'm using it in what it was intended for, for commerce. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, Mikhail, as you're, as you're mentioning the, the tax strategies, why don't we kind of go over some of the, let's say the most preferential places when we're thinking about, you know, trying to mitigate some of those, let's say capital gains or, or different, you know, ab again, abusive, abusive programs like that. I know we were speaking before about the program in the, or that's available to us citizens in Puerto Rico for the act 20 and 22, which has been rolled into a uh, one act. Act, 60. Was, act yep, 60. Act 60 now. Yeah. So you know, kind of run us through a couple of the advantageous tax strategies or or jurisdictions from from your perspective. Sure. So that's kind of a two part question. I'll I'll answer the <clears throat> jurisdictions first, and then we can go into a couple of the tools in the toolbox. Uh, jurisdictions we usually like to work with countries that have no income tax nor corporate tax. So this would be traditionally known as like a tax haven or an offshore jurisdiction. Um, there's about 45, 46 countries, depending on how you count, that would qualify for this. Uh, I lived in the Middle East for eight years. This is an excellent example. I lived in Abu Dhabi 
Um, if you guys haven't heard of Abu Dhabi, it's basically an hour's drive from Dubai. It's the capital of the United Arab Emirates. And they have no taxes there. The year that I left or the year uh, after I left, they did impose a 5% VAT, but there's no wealth tax. There's no um, capital gains tax. There's no income tax on the personal side or on the corporate side. So it makes things very, very easy. Um, currently, I live in Panama. This is what's called a territorial tax system. So Panama really cares about where the money is made, not where you are. So if you structure things correctly, and absolutely, you have to work with a professional on this, with a international CPA or a Panamanian lawyer or with me or whomever, make sure that this is all um, done correctly. Because I'm, I'm not nothing in today's conversation. I'm giving financial, legal, mm -hmm. or uh, immigration advice by any means. Um, so if you look at Panama, really what you can do is you can have things structured here, live here full time, but all of your money is made offshore and you can repatriate funds into the country and not have to worry about taxes. That doesn't necessarily mean that you won't have tax obligations to your home country. Those are kind of two separate um, problems that we need to deal with is the country that you're living in and then the country that you came from or where you hold citizenship. Mm -hmm. uh, from Canada, it's very easy. Canada and most of Europe and most countries in the world are, are very simple. The, the strategy is this. You get a residency overseas, you leave, you pay all appropriate taxes or all your tax obligations in your home country, and you don't go back. If you can do those three, three and a half, possibly four things, you should be pretty good from the tax side. Mm -hmm. So that means uh, telling the Canadian government that you are not coming back, making Panama your tax home or Abu Dhabi or Dubai or Oman or something like this, your tax home, uh, paying any taxes that are um, required of you to your home go government, filing a, a final tax return and having your residency and living overseas. From the U.S. side, it's a little bit more complicated because the U.S. is the only, well, one of two countries in the world who tax based on citizenship, not on residency. So the only other country is Eritrea and Africa, which is a dictatorship and is known for blatant human rights violations. So I will, I will let you make your own conclusions about the U.S. tax system based off of that. But with the U.S., we do a, a second scenario. It's called the Foreign Earned Income Exclusion, F-E-I-E. -E. I encourage you to go look it up on the IRS website. And what it says is that you can spend, um, if you spend uh, roughly uh, 330 days in a foreign country, because it's not roughly, it's exactly. So you have the Foreign Earned Income Exclusion. And what this is, is a tax strategy to shelter your first, let's say, roughly $110,000 of earned income. So foreign earned income exclusion. There's a couple of like caveats in that. It has to be earned income. That means it can't be uh, interest payments on your bank account. It can't be, it's not your capital gains or these types of things. It's your job. Or if you run a business and you pay yourself a salary. Um, and then there's a couple of caveats. So you actually have to uh, either live in a country for 330 days that would be called the physical presence test, or you do the bona fide residency test. Um, we usually do physical presence test year one and the bona fide residency year two. And if you have a spouse, then it's a doubling effect. So you can look at close to $220,000 tax free. So the US really cares about where you are and not where the money is. And Panama or Costa Rica or Belize or these countries care about where the money is and not where you are. So it kind of fits hand in glove. So these are the types of things. And then on top of this, you can look at foreign tax credits. You can look at housing credits. There's a whole bunch of different tax strategies that we go into and I work with all my private clients. And everything is signed off by a lawyer. Everything is signed off by a licensed CPA. So we create these ideas and concepts and we follow the laws. And then the lawyer agrees with what we say and we have an, a legal opinion on it before we take any action. Mm -hmm. Make sense? Yep. I, I think it would be good to go over, let's say, the differences between citizenship and residency. And you, you kind of alluded to it in your last answer there. But, you know, if if there's any advantage or need to have to renounce a citizenship of of your, you know, your your initial country, you were you were a citizen in. Sure. I mean, the only country that ever renounces their citizenship is the United States. And it happens. <laughs> Every single day, thousands of people around the world are renouncing their U.S. citizenship. A lot of that happens because there, which is 
called anchor babies. It's not really a nice, polite term, but it is one that gets passed around a lot. So someone flies in, has their baby there. They're a U.S. citizen. They go back to France or Italy or wherever they live, Japan. And now the child is a U.S. citizen. When they hit 18 years old, they now are required for they have a tax obligation to the United States. Well, that can be quite cumbersome. Even if you're not making huge amounts of money, you still need to file. And if you don't understand how to file, then you know you probably have to hire a professional, which can cost thousands of dollars, especially for the international side. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a lot of people who don't agree with US foreign policy, so do not want to be involved in that. Um, It's really the only country that has such an abusive relationship, because if you move overseas, you still have to pay, you still have to fund uh, the U.S. government. Canada, all of Europe, South America, no other country has this. You just deregister yourself from that country. You show that you are now a tax resident somewhere else. You have a tax home. And in most instances, this is enough to cover you. Now your tax obligation is to that country, the country that you actually use the services. So if your house burns down, then the fire department is to take there to take care of you. You use the roads, you use the medical facilities, all of the, the school system, you use all of these types of things. So you're not paying for it in a country that you don't use, which I think makes sense. I mean, personally, I don't agree in a lot of taxation. I'm very libertarian in my thinking on this, but at least if I'm going to pay taxes, I want it to go towards a service that I, me and my family are actually using. Mm -hmm. Um, The difference between residency and citizenship. um, All right. There's a couple, a resident. And and in in this instance, we're talking specifically about permanent residencies is a legal right to live and work in the country. So you can come and go. I mean, there's lots of countries that were closed during COVID, but if you were a resident or a citizen, you could still come and go. They were closed to tourists, not residents. Mm -hmm. You can buy property there. You can um, you know, if they have a stock market, it's easy to get a brokerage account, bank accounts. All of these things are very, very simple. You can participate in the national health care if that's what you want to do, or if you if that is your need, maybe I should say. Um, and that's kind of the limit. I mean, a residency can lead to a citizenship, but you're not getting a passport. The citizenship will allow you to get the travel document, which we know as a passport. Uh, A citizenship will allow you to say, I am Panamanian, I am Brazilian, I am wherever. Um, You can participate in the national service if that's something that you want to do. Uh, Some countries still have a restraint if you're not born there. So we're seeing that now with Turkey. Turkey does a citizenship by investment program. There is a uh, mandatory national service for um, males that hit 18 years old, but they're getting rid of it for foreigners. So if your parents bought the citizenship and two years later, for example, you hit 18, you're not going to have to serve in their their military or their armed forces. Um, and then what's the last one? The last one is uh, the register to vote. I mean, if you're a resident, you're not going to be able to vote. If you're a citizen, you can vote. Um, democratic process. So you have to think how important are these things for you? I think the passport is definitely very valuable. And there's people who just make large contributions to a country to get the passport so that they, if their home country passport gets canceled or um, they lose it, or they don't have visa-free travel to that country, then they might be able to use the other country uh, to get in. So for example, you and I are both Canadians. We can't enter Russia, but we're going for our Brazilian citizenship. And with Brazilians, we can enter Russia. So that is a country that I would not get to enter normally that now I could. Probably I would not want to do so at this very moment, but you know, this will calm down in one day, inshallah. And you know, that will be an opportunity. And there's lots of like overlap on countries that you can and cannot go to. Mm-hmm. So, you know, obviously there's there's some countries that must be easier to get residency in or or even citizenship than others. So what are some different ways of obtaining residency in other countries? Yeah, there's four main ways that we can look up or four plus one. Um, All right. In no particular order, you have citizenship by investment. So it's an economic donation or investment into the country. And in return, you are granted citizenship and with the citizenship comes a passport. So there's five countries in the Caribbean. There's one in the South Pacific and there's a couple in Europe, one in the EU and and one outside of the EU. So economic means. Then there's by birth. 
by um, if you're actually born in that country. So, you know, my son was born in Brazil, so he is a Brazilian citizen. And funny enough, um, because I'm the legal guardian of a Brazilian citizen, I get to apply what's called my family reunification visa, and I get my permanent residency on the back of my 10-month-old son. Um, but it's the same type of thing that we had talked about before. If someone from France flies over to the United States, that child is now a U.S. citizen. Well, this happens actually pretty much all Latin American countries. So if you have your child in Mexico or in Costa Rica or in Panama, where I'm talking to you from today, well, that child can get citizenship. So you can have um, uh, via birth. You have via ancestry. So if your parents parents or grandparents, or in some cases, even great grandparents, if they're from Ireland or Italy or Poland or um, some of the former uh, USSR countries, I mean, you can get your citizenship by ancestry through those. Um, there's uh, citizenship by marriage. If your spouse is from Mexico, you can apply for citizenship after a certain period of time. Um, if your parents are born in a country, so like for example, the, the same type on the ancestry, it doesn't have to be from Europe. My kids are also Canadian citizen, even though like my son's never been to Canada. My daughter was born in the Middle East. They're both Canadian citizen. Um, there's religious ways to get citizenship. This is kind of the plus one, the religious. So if you're Jewish, then you might be able to get a Portuguese or a Spanish passport. If you're if you can trace your lineage back a couple hundred years to a certain sect of Judaism, then there might be a passport there for you. Same for the right of return back to Israel, then you could get a passport there. Mm -hmm. So there's so many creative ways to go this. You can do naturalization. I mean, I said four plus one, actually. I'm, I'm, a couple of these kind of fall in the, the plus one. There's naturalization. You can live in a country for five years, 10 years, 20 years. Switzerland, you could live there for 20 years and you could get a Swiss passport. You're going to have to have that residency first. You have to have things set up. There's a taxation scheme that you have to enter into. But there's many different ways to skin the cat, you could say. Mm -hmm. And in your case, obviously, you're you're traveling and, and living in, in many different countries. Is there any limit to the number of residencies that you can hold at any one time? There technically is no limit. However, practically there is. For a lot of these countries, you're going to have to show um, physical presence in the country. So mm -hmm. for example, Panama has a permanent residency here. If you are a permanent resident, you need to visit the country one day every two years. That's a pretty lax obligation. Mm -hmm. It's a really good one. But let's see that, say that you're doing the Portuguese D7 visa. You need to spend 183 days in the country, which makes you a tax resident of there. And you need to do that every year. So if you're doing that and you're doing Panama and you're doing Uruguay and you're doing Mexico and all of them have their own obligations for how much time you spend in the country, then those can interfere with each other. Ecuador, you have to almost spend the entire first year of your residency in Ecuador. I don't think you can leave for more than a week or two weeks or something like that in your first year. So if you're doing that and another one, I mean, that's not practical. So as I said, technically, yes, you can have many residencies. It's up to you to be able to juggle them and keep them active. So you mentioned that both of your, your kids were born in, in different countries. So how do you consider your, your children in your plans? Are there different constraints that you have to consider from financial versus freedom or educational standpoints when you're, when you're thinking about moving to and, and moving between all of these different places with your kids? So um, my kids are very international as well. I mean, as I said, they have multiple passports. My daughter is five years old. She speaks uh, English, Mandarin, Chinese, and Spanish all at native level. And she studies Russian two hours a day. We're working on her Russian. She's been to 15 countries already. Uh, we homeschool her. We don't put her in public education. Um, at the moment, we homeschool her when she's probably seven or eight years old, then she will enter our school. I have a business partner and we created a, an online school for international families. It's called Expat International School. If you go to expatschool.io, you can find out more information about the platform. It's really for families who live a lifestyle like I do, either digital nomads, perpetual travelers, expats. Uh, people who just live overseas or, or do a lot of business internationally and they want to bring their family with them, um, or even people who are stateside but don't 
want to send their kids to a traditional public education or want to send them to a private school or a charter school. You know, they want an international school and in a more freedom loving environment because our value stream is liberty, peace, prosperity, freedom. I mean, this is what we stand for. The full name of the the school is Expat International School of Freedom and Entrepreneurship. And I think that title really does say a lot because this is what we believe in. And all of the, we don't call them teachers, we call them guides. This is, they all have a background in entrepreneurship. They all have a belief pattern, which, you know, falls in line with these types of things. So, I mean, it's certainly not a cheap program by any means, but I think that the alternative of putting your kids into you know, public education with the indoctrination and with these mask mandates and, you know, little kids having to sit in hula hoops and social distancing when we know that, you know, this stuff is not dangerous to them. And, you know, it's just things that I don't agree with. And a lot of my subscribers and followers don't agree with. And then like, I'm not here to tell anyone what they should believe, but I can tell you that if you don't believe in it, that there are alternatives out there for you. But yeah, man, we're a really international family. We take our kids like everywhere with us. Um, my daughter gets to see how daddy does business and I, you know, run my business online in Zoom. I do all my private consulting, uh, you know, via applications like this. All my clients are spread around the world. Um, I think it's a great way to, to live and an education to give our kids. Um, I wouldn't do it any other way. I mean, I, I really believe in this stuff a lot. And I just think, I mean, it's the education that I wish I had. Let's, mm -hmm. let's put it that way. Yeah, it sounds like a, an excellent upbringing that you're you're giving your kids. And just a, a short, I guess, quick story. My mom was a teacher. And when my sister and I were 11 years old, we basically sold everything in, in Canada, bought a motorhome and a school bus. The All of our storage was the school bus. And we lived and traveled in throughout Mexico for seven months, homeschooled for a total of two years. Uh, traveled and, um, you know, saw, saw a lot of Mexico. Um, I guess that would have been like the mid to late nineties when, you know, a lot of people thought it was, it was far more dangerous than it actually is. And mm -hmm. interestingly enough, the, the only problems we ever actually had were in the States on our way through and never had an issue in, in Mexico. So it's, it's really interesting to hear about the the school and the, let's say the values that you're bringing your kids up with there. That's amazing. That sounds like not just like an amazing educational experience for you, but the bond that you get to ha share with your mother and with your siblings and, you know, those memories. I mean, I'm all about experiences. I love to be able to, I, I have a friend of mine visiting me. I've known him since I was five years old. And we were sitting downstairs today and we were talking about trips that we've done around the world. We were in Turkey together. We were in the Middle East together. And I mean, we'll always remember that. And we look back and it was like, that was nine years ago. I'm like, that's crazy. And we're still laughing about all the things we did and, you know, so many good memories. For me, these types of experiences, especially with family or with really close friends, I mean, that's irreplaceable. That's wealth to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I couldn't I couldn't agree more. And some of my best memories are are traveling abroad, traveling overseas, just traveling in general. I mean, the the whole reason that I have the privilege of doing this podcast is because of traveling and and meeting some of the people that I have. And you know, I I know we have met some of the same people like Gregor Gregerson who's I would not have met had I been able to travel to Lithuania, for example. It's uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it's it's you know, such a, a valuable thing to expose you to all of these different ideas and to show you what's, what's really important. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. So the, one of the only other things I wanted to, to touch on, you mentioned that your son was, was born in Brazil. So what are some of the considerations that you have towards something like medical tourism as well? Um, medical tourism is something that I have been doing for years and years and years. I didn't even know there was a name for it until about 10 years ago, but I mean, like, uh, my dentist or the dentist I used to use was in South Korea and I lived in Abu Dhabi. And when I needed a dental checkup, I went to South Korea because they have the best facilities in the world, the most highly trained doctors, the prices are phenomenal. My best friend from back home, uh, lives there. Um, the godfather of my, of my daughter lived there. So I would go and visit, I would go get a cleaning, you know, any dental work. 
that was a normal thing. Um, when my mother needed to have eye surgery, I sent her to Korea. Uh, we, she had other stuff done in Thailand. I sent her over to Thailand. We were just in Colombia um, several months ago, and I did a huge YouTube video, like a, I think it's like a 30 minute video talking with an expert on medical tourism in Colombia, what type of procedures are good, the advantages, the reasons why you might want to do it, the price points, you know, what to be aware of, who should you work with. I mean, if you guys go to, if you could just search out, um, if you search out expat money, Mikkel, M-I-K-K-E-L, you'll be able to find me on YouTube and you can easily find that video on there. It's super helpful. Um, it's all about finding you know, the best people that do these specialized types of things. Back home in Canada, it's like, okay, yeah, we have great doctors and everything. Fantastic. But if you need to have an MRI, it could be three months before you get it. Mm -hmm. But if you go down to the States or you go to a private clinic or you come down to Columbia, I mean, we'll get you in the next day. Like, there's no long waiting periods. You see a specialist immediately. I mean, you see a specialist in Panama for like 50 bucks or something like that. And you'll get his, their WhatsApp number and you can message them on WhatsApp to do your appointments. Like it's, it's hilarious. I mean, there's just so many alternatives out there for doing these types of things that you don't need to only look to your backyard. I mean, 193 countries in the world, the world's a big place. I mean, mm -hmm. I have been traveling nonstop for 22 years and I feel like I've barely scratched the surface of what there is to see and do in this country. There's so many different ways to view it and perspectives on this. Yeah, man, it's just get out there and travel, go out there and explore these things, make your own decisions. Don't just watch mainstream media. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I mean, that's, that's such an important point because it's, you, you don't realize who will treat you and even your, your capital better than than the experience that you know and have have come to think is normal unless you actually go out and, and try to experience some of those things right for sure absolutely so as part of your columbia video did you cover the risks of colombian butt implants <laughs> <laughs> i think we did it's called a mummy makeover so they do liposuction and all of these types of things uh some of the stuff is very weird other stuff is very normal like um I, I have one client who was doing hair transplants in Colombia. He's going to be flying down there. I had another one who's doing stem cells because he played a lot of college ball when he was young and, you know, destroyed his rotator cuffs and needs to do stem cell there. And it's like things that are not approved in the U S I'm not sure about Canada for this one, but not approved in the U S they are approved there. I mean, with stem cells in the U S from my understanding, they just take the stem cells and then they give them to you. In Colombia and these other countries, they can actually culture them and grow them. So there will actually be like a multiple, like millions more stem cells in the same type of dosage. So you get a lot more bang for your buck on these types of things. And I mean, I, this was all news to me. I, I mean, this is not the field I work in. I don't work in medical tourism, but I do think it is a very interesting topic. And so I went down there and we looked at different procedures and, you know, did a lot of due diligence on a firm there that helps and consults with people. And, you know, I've been sending my clients over there and it's been great. I mean, you get to see a new country, you get to do your recovery in a stunning, beautiful place. You have a bit of adventure, better cost of living, highly skilled doctors, you're driving their economy. I mean, it's a win all around. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mikhail, I, I think that's a, a great place to kind of wrap up today's conversation. Uh, of course, if anybody has any questions, they can forward them to both you and I. Your handle on Twitter is at Thorup Mikkel, M-I-K-K-E-L. And of course, your new new website uh, mm -hmm. at expatmoney.com. Anywhere else you'd like to point to? I think those are two really good places. The only other thing I could say is if you guys listen to podcasts, you know, whatever podcast app that you listen on, you will find me there. I mean, we've been podcasting for about six years now, so there's a ton of back, category, uh, back catalog of episodes to go through. I encourage you to go and listen to them. And yeah, that's it. Happy to help your audience any way I can. Excellent, Mikkel. I really appreciate your time and your perspective today. Thanks so much, Tom. This podcast is for general informational purposes only. Nothing on this podcast should be taken as investment advice. Guests on this show are not compensated for their appearance. 
Listeners are urged to educate themselves and make their own decisions. Do not base any investment decisions on the information contained. To view our full disclaimer, please visit our website.